amphibians. Um, we have a epic storm heading our way, barreling across the Pacific right now. So if you're an amphibian, you're going, yes. Um, so it's going to be a great time to uh, get out to a pond, find a friend, and spawn. Um, and uh, we will be ready once the rain clears uh, with our sketchbooks to um, to get some uh, get our herp on. And so uh, wanted to uh, to take a, a close look at drawing reptiles and amphibians. And so this class is not just about it's going to be partially a, a about the natural history of reptiles and amphibians that is relevant to us as sketchers. Some stuff about uh, their natural history that is just because it's so cool. Um, and hope to uh, kind of uh, increase your love of the herps. Um, also, we're going to be looking at a few basic drawing principles that will apply to anything else that you're drawing. You'll see that a lot of the fundamentals of drawing these guys, it's just the same as what we've been doing with drawing birds or drawing mammals. Um, a few little tricks for drawing kind of the wet skin or the um, scales of a reptile. But the, um, the fundamentals are very much the same. One last thing I'm going to also do in this workshop is introduce you to a uh, little bit of uh, kind of put our toe in the water of drawing, uh, doing some stuff with the new media. I've done a lot of demonstrations with uh, sketching with watercolor. And today what I'd like to do is also take a look at starting to play with a little bit of gouache paint and uh, what you can do with that. And um, some people, like David Sibley, do all, tons of stuff with gouache. And I've always struggled with it, because whenever I would put my gouache into my palette, they would dry and crack into little pieces and crumble apart. But I now have been starting to play with uh, paints by M. Graham and Schminke and um, Holbein. And they don't do that nearly as much. And so I may have a new friend in gouache. And so expect more of that in future workshops. But today we're going to kind of put our toe in the gouache water and see why you might want to have some fun playing with that. Um, before I uh, get into the workshop, I want to thank um, uh, Gary Nafis of CaliforniaHerps.com. He has put together the most beautiful website on the reptiles and amphibians of California. And you'll find incredible photographs there, up-to-date natural history information, range maps, all of this good stuff. Um, so uh, as, uh, at the end of the class, I'll give you a little bit of homework about just some sketches and drawings you're going to do to kind of help reinforce the things you're going to look at. I really recommend that people go to CaliforniaHerps.com to get um, resource material that will blow your mind. Just exquisite, exquisite photographs and really good science information that is, um, is, is very, very carefully vetted. So that's whenever I've got a question, I find some cool thing in my backyard, that's the first place that I go. Um, so check that out. And thank you very much. Mad props to California Herps. Um, we're going to be, t uh, so by saying Herps, um, this is a catch-all term for reptiles and amphibians. Um, it's kind of an unnatural grouping. Um, it kind of comes from, I guess, Linnaeus early on was sort of looked around and there were several categories of things. You can see those things over there, those are birds. Those are mammals over there, those are plants. And then there's this other category of things that crawl on the ground, right? Which included insects and reptiles and amphibians, all these things that crawled on the ground. And they all got lumped into this bin. And uh, as an artifact of the fact that we often find both reptiles and amphibians under a log, the people who study them kind of uh, will bump into both reptiles and amphibians. We have this group which we call the, the herps, the reptiles and amphibians. But it's not, it's as sort of, it's just based on the fact that you often find them in similar sorts of places. They're very distantly related. Um, the, uh, you could just as well sort of have a category with, you know, squirrels and bumblebees. You know, two completely different groups, but you study, if you happen to find them in the same kind of hole in a tree, you'd say, oh yeah, these should be studied together. But um, amphibians, what are the characteristics, of, what are some characteristics of amphibians or examples of amphibians? Open question. What, what am I hearing? So salamanders. So salamanders, who else? Let's go. Frogs, newts, and, and toads, great. Um, the, the, uh, and what? Um, so um, 
there's another group which uh, we don't really have uh, here, so we don't uh, think about them, but um, people from another uh, part of the world who would be studying these things would say Sicilians, which are these sort of strange worm-like, not Sicilians, um, <laughs> Sicilians um, are these things, they're kind of strange worm-like, kind of, if you kind of put a worm and a snake together, and it was an amphibian, they're these, they're cool little critters, but we don't have them here. So we'll be looking at um, the salamanders and newts and frogs and toads, um, those wonderful little beasties. They all have a smooth, moist skin. Some of them can actually breathe through their skin. So they have to keep that skin moist so that you can get air um, going through it. Um, we're going to start with our little salamander friends. Um, and what is, uh, what is the difference between salamanders and newts? So the, uh, you, you said what? So newts in their larval stages will have gills, absolutely right. Um, and so they're obligate breeders in water. They have to uh, lay their eggs in water, and their early life stages has to be in water. There are salamanders that can crawl under a damp log and go, hey, this is like a great place to lay my eggs, pop them out, and their eggs will hatch there. But the newts have to go to the water. So they're just a very aquatic salamander that then has a terrestrial stage. Um, before we get into sort of a demo of drawing one, I want to show you a, just a couple of anatomical features about salamanders, which will help you. You want to look for them on the critter. Just as, like, if you know the difference between primary and secondary feathers, when you look at the bird, it's easier to understand what you're seeing. Similarly, there's a few kind of anatomical points on salamanders, which we want to have on our radar. Um, so here is my head of my salamander friend. First, notice these big, cute, buggy eyes. Um, the salamander eyes are just giant things inside here, and then there's a little, um, there's a thick eyelid over the top of it. When you're drawing these eyes, think of them as a big round object in there, and then the eyelid has to wrap around that. Um, so you'll have these very prominent buggy eyes on a lot of these critters. Some of the salamanders, you will also see on their nostril up here, there's a little lip that connects, a little ridge, uh, sorry, a group, um, that connects the nostril and the lower lip here, or the upper lip. So there's a little nasolabial groove there. That is a characteristic that can help you with identification of the salamander that you're looking at. And you'll see it there. It also helps you with you know, drawing what you see, knowing that that's a good place to look. Another interesting feature on the head here is this gular fold. There's sort of a flap of skin that comes down behind the jaw here and makes this extra little lip on the underside of the head. Um, so uh, you can look for that on your salamanders as well. Those are a few features of their head that you should sort of have in your vocabulary, things to, to, to notice. A lot of these things, if you didn't know that this was a major structural feature, you just would say, oh, there's some wrinkle on it somewhere. There's a lot of wrinkles everywhere, but not realize that, oh, this is one that I should pay attention to. Um, so here is our salamander seeing the whole body. A um, couple of features to notice here. Here's that guler fold. Let's also notice that there are little ridges going all the way down the body. Um, these costal grooves, whoops, not you, you. Um, these little costal grooves you see there on these sketches here, boom, 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 right, um, are um, not just random wrinkles because it's bending somewhere, but these are, are distinct grooves. Even when it s extends its body out, you'll still see these. So you can count these if you're doing a very careful scientific illustration or just represent them if you're doing a quicker sketch. Um, a lot of scientists in measuring these things, they'll take the little front leg and swing it back here and the back leg and swing it up here and just they'll count how many grooves there are between the oppressed limbs when they flatten them. So the relative proportions of the body length, the leg length, they can kind of get a measure of that by oppressing the limbs and counting these sort of things. The other thing that's great about these costal grooves is that they give a because they're lines that wrap up on the body, they really help you sort of show the roundness 
and dimension in that body. Anytime you have a line that goes around a cylindrical object, that can help you sort of show the dimensions of that. So they help us also showing the shape in our drawings. One last thing are the cute little salamander toes. Four, usually four up front and five in the back, usually. And um, the, uh, the, they have nice little articulated toes. So very often you'll see clear little joints in them. So spend some time, kind of look at their salamander toes, and that will help you kind of give a, um, a lot of personality to the sketch you're doing. And in many species, there are actually identification characteristics that you see just there in the toes. So there are long-toed salamanders, which have long toes. There are others with webbing between the toes, or some really short, stubby toes. So there's different, some will have very squared off tips. So look at the shapes of the toes, and it actually ends up being a place where there's a whole bunch of identification characteristics right down there in the, the tips of the, the fingers. You wouldn't think to really look there for what's going to, it's going to be a big deal in terms of identifying what sort of salamander you're looking at. I'm now going to go through a step-by-step -step approach of how I might, from start to finish, draw a salamander. And in this, what I want to point out is that this is going to be really no different than if you've seen any of the other workshops on, say, how to draw birds, where I take the bird and break it down into fundamentally, we're going to try to look for the posture, the proportions, and the angles. You're going to see exactly the same sort of thing going on in drawing one of these salamanders. Um, so let's start with the posture line. For the bird, it was just the general angle of the lean of the torso of the body. In the salamander, imagine the spine going all the way down the back of this. So uh, the midline down the back of the salamander down from the, the head up here to the tip of the tail. Um, and what I'll often do is lightly and loosely kind of go, it's doing this thing here. And you kind of go over that a few times to correct it if you don't kind of get there. You go, ah, oh, yeah, that's my posture. That's going to be better than drawing one careful line that that's it. This sort of lets you kind of, the uh, indefinite nature of making a few lines like this helps you kind of modify the angle, the position of your line, should you choose to. So that gives me my salamander posture. And now I'm going to build over that with my proportions. Remember, for the bird, we put in an oval for the head and the body. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And the advantage of doing this is it lets me, gives me a stage to look at how wide is the head versus how long it is. What is the proportion of how much of this thing is head versus body versus tail? How wide is this versus how long this is? And I want to solve those things at the start when it's easier. If I need, like, I need my salamander to be a little bit chubbier. Okay. All right, it just got a little bit more weight. Or maybe it's a slender style. Oh, that's, it needs to be even more slender than that. Um, you can modify those sorts of things very, very easily in this initial sketch. Later on, once you're drawing, you know, here's kind of the costal grooves and drawing in those details. If you then realize you made your, your, your salamander is too slim, you're not going to want to get back in there and and erase all those details and change it. So this is a very modifiable, easily modified stage. So when I'm drawing this, this is usually when I've got my erasable non-photo blue pencil out and I'm lightly blocking in the shape on my piece of paper. I'm now going to add a couple of structural features on this. In terms of the skull of this, I'm interested in the plane that the eyes sit. Right? Um, the eyes, I, I don't want one eye really forward and the other eye back. I want my eyes to be aligned with the front of the face of the, of the head here. So here are two lines to block in my eyes. Here is the angle of where its shoulders are from where one leg starts to the others. And here's the, where the angles of the back legs are going to be. I want to look at where on this body do these things come out. And then I'll be hooking my limbs onto those points. So let's put those limbs on. I'm not drawing detailed legs. These are just sort of placeholders for the legs. Um, I've got my humerus coming out, my radius and ulna coming down here in the forearm to the little hand. I'm not drawing the toes yet. These are just placeholders. Um, 
if, uh, and so Ashok, you might want to get, get ready for this because this is going to be a, an action shot where you're going to want to see what's, what's going on here. Um, I'm going to turn myself into a salamander. All right? So if I am a salamander, If I'm a salamander, here's my one salamander arm, my other salamander arm. I am doing this, right? And as I walk around, I'm going to go, uh, okay, let's see, how can I do this? Let's see, here we go, uh, here we go, oh, here we go. So the salamander walks around like this. These front feet are, they swing in, right? I'll come back here. Um, so the front feet are swinging in, the back feet kind of flared out. It's doing this sort of eternal push-up. They're not good at putting the legs underneath the body like a horse or a dog. They are sprawled out like this, so that when they're resting, they're like, oh, I'm tired. I just disqualified myself from ever teaching this. Oh. So it's like, so this is, this is a salamander yoga, right? All right. Um, these, these hands sort of swing in a little bit. Oh, yeah, with the hands and feet, usually four toes up front, five in the back. Did I mention that? Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. Okay, four in the front. All right, so the, um, with this little sprawl, that means if here's my little body and my little legs are out like this, this one here, you see all of this humerus looks long. This humerus here is foreshortened away from you, so that's going to appear shorter. So very often, if they're doing this, it's not that the, the, it's the people will have a tendency to want to draw both these bones the same length. But if one, if they're both rocked down like this, this one gets foreshortened. So let's take a look at how that looks here. Our buddy's back. Keystone announcement, you can go away. But look at this humerus here. The one that's coming towards you, long, the further ones back, they're short. So <coughs> you can expect to see that. Your brain, because you know it's symmetrical, will want to make those equally long. But knowing in advance that foreshortening happens, will help you catch that. So the next thing I'm going to do is, just as I did with those birds, I visualize the negative spaces between those limbs and the head. So if I'm just focusing myself on um, what is the shape of this leg, what is the shape of this leg, it'd be really easy for me to get this space to be too long or too short. Um, <clears throat> little so I'm going to show you this uh, drawing that I did very carefully, scale by scale, of this lizard. But I didn't pay attention to this negative space. And all the detail is perfect on the lizard, except that this space is way too small. All right? So by getting myself to focus on the negative space, I'm going to catch that at this stage when I can still do something about it, other than just confess. All right? Um, so I don't color these spaces in. This is what I visualize in order to draw these lines. All right. So I'm going to block in the shapes of those negative spaces. Also, um, I'm going to be putting in the, the rest of the tail here. I've just put in a few dots to make myself pay attention to how thick I want to keep that tail. It's really easy as I'm drawing in the other side of the tail to make it too skinny. This is going to help me kind of keep that sort of chubby tail of the Ancetina. And now I'm ready on top of this blue pencil background to start drawing in with my graphite pencil the, the details. This will be kind of a jump in the illustration. I'm going to draw this in. But this is done from one of Gary's photographs on uh, CaliforniaHerbs.com. So when I did the drawing, I had a photographs in front of me. You'll have either a photograph or you'll have the real critter uh, in front of you. So this is done. I, I don't expect everybody to like, like, then fill it in. You're supposed to somehow have this knowledge of how to draw all the little details of the thing. No, 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 no. This is uh, the next step is going to be where you're going, you're adding the details from what you're looking at 
on top of this structural framework. You can focus on the details because you already have the framework. In doing this, I want to get a sense of the curves of this body. And these little illustrations from back in our tree drawing workshop come into play again. Where if I'm drawing something that is a curving surface, and it's curving away from me or towards me, that's going to change the direction of the lines that wrap around the body. So if there's a costal groove, it can wrap around this way. Or if there's a crease as the tail is, is, is wrapping around here. See how these lines suggest the roundness of these parts of the limb, of, this, of the tail here. The way that these wrap around suggests the roundness of this body. As I am drawing this, I'm looking for, anytime I see one of those little lines, I go, oh yeah, this will help show the depth and the structure of what I'm doing. So I'm really intentionally looking for those little cracks and creases. That's why I love costal grooves. Little, cute little salamander toes. It has a bunch of yellow spots on it, I would have to work around those yellow spots. But because I am going to be doing this with an opaque gouache, I can ignore the spots at the start and then add them in later. So if I'm drawing dark spots on a light surface, it's easy. I just paint and then I get to dark spots and I paint in my dark spots. I can't do that if I'm re using regular watercolor. I have those, if I've painted dark in area, if I take light yellow and put it into some dark spot, it's not going to show up. It's not going to clear that back to white paper. But I can do that with gouache. So with this, um, my approach with gouache is that I treat the entire drawing just as a regular watercolor painting. And I'm actually going to be using my watercolors up until the point where we'll see the gouache come in. So this is going to start just because it's going to look like a regular watercolor painting. And what I'm using here to put in my darks is my watercolors. So I put my darks in with transparent watercolors, and then I'm going to use my opaque gouache to add the lights. Let's take a look at how this works. So I start with the shadows. If I put the shadows in first, I have this blank slate to think about how light falls on this. If I put the shadows in at the end, it'll feel like an afterthought because it is. All right, so um, here I put my shadows in, the lights coming in from this side, in the back here, illuminating this part, leaving this part in shadow. So I can, here's my little reflected light right in here along this edge. I let that dry, and I can put, I'm now going to start with watercolor going from the lightest to the darkest. So we, with watercolor, you start light and you build up towards the dark. So the lighter parts of this thing's skin were this sort of pale, purplishy, um, kind of barney color. Right? And so here's the purple, light purple, kind of barney colored salamander. A little bit of light blue coming into these big bulbous eyes. Very beautiful little shade of blue. I let this dry, and then on top of that, I can add in the darker pigments that are more on the back side of it. So, again, this is just with watercolor. But now I've got these yellow spots that are all over its body. I put my watercolor aside, let it dry, and I pull out my gouache. Gouache is just like house paint. It's completely opaque, but it's water-based, so I can use my same little water brush. I dip it into, I mix up some sort of thick mixture. I don't want it watery. I make a thick mixture of gouache, and I can paint my yellow spots right onto this. Ooh, that's so easy, all right? So I can make light spots on a dark surface. Thank you. So this is o opaque, so the whitish part of it is because I added white to it. But the yellow itself that you mixed with the gouache is... Oh, oh I actually I had some yellowy ochre gouache. and some I, I used white and some brownish ochre gouache and some yellow gouache, and I mixed all those together to make these spots, colors. Oh, so you can't mix gouache with it? Oh, I, I can. I, I can tint it with watercolor. Um, so I could take white, water, uh, white gouache. I could even put down a white pot of white gouache and then tint that with some watercolor and one glaze over it. But sometimes when I put water over gouache that's there, it likes to lift up and move around because it's just sitting there on the top of the paper. So I can easily re-wet it and move it around and it makes a mess. So, okay, so gouache... For, uh, so gouache is, it's, it's, it's a paint-like watercolor, but it is opaque. And it comes in all these different colors. So in my palette, 
I had, I, I actually, I don't need a bunch of dark colors of gouache. If I have a light surface and I want a dark line across it, then all I have to do is get out my dark watercolor and draw that dark line in. But if I have a dark surface and I want to put in a light line across it or a light spot, then what I can do is mix up that with gouache and paint it in there. So with the little gouache kit I'm starting to, to create, I've got a bunch of very sort of pale light colors. And those are the ones that I want because I'm going to put those on top of a dark surface. And I don't need some dark, rich indigo black. Right? I can have that over in my watercolor set. Does that make sense? Yes. If all you have is the white gouache. Oh, so if, if all you had, okay, if all I had is white gouache, what I might do is put down a little white spot, let it dry, then mix up some color that I want to tint that, and once it's dry, come in with one coat and hit it with that, and it won't have time to re-wet and start moving around. I've just tinted it with whatever color I've put on. I can then wait for it to dry a little bit if I want it more intense color, get it all dry, then I can hit it with another little coat on top of it. So I can add color to light spots of gouache. Did that answer the question? Yeah, so that, that works. A water. Yes, with little water. That's right, little water because I want it to be thick, opaque goop. So we can still use the palette behind because it does have the white gouache. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm going to keep my gouache palette separate from my regular watercolor because the opacity, if, that gets, if those opaque paints get mixed in with all my transparent watercolors, it can have more of a sort of chalky look to it. It doesn't have the same brilliance as those transparent watercolors. So I'm going to keep those little palettes separate. So I'm just sort of making a little extra little gouache palette over the side. I used one of those um, Winsor Newton pocket sketcher box things. Um, this is my gouache palette. Oh. This is a gouache palette from Ashok of Winsor Newton colors. And look, you see it's got magenta in there. Yes, very good, love it. And so, so like having these pale tans, these pale whites and things, this pale green, those are the ones you're gonna be reaching for all the time. Um, but it's actually not as important to have like some of the darks in there. So as you're kind of replacing those, you can kind of get you know, some of your, maybe a few primary sorts of things in there. But then um, you know, you're really gonna find you reach, when I look at this, I see that the, the white and those, those tans, they're really getting used a lot. Thank you. This guy's just about done. I'm going to do two more things to it. One, I'm going to add, just to get a little brown pencil and add a few little divots of darkness, um, uh, which is an expression I picked up from Ann Cottle at the UC Illustration, uh, Scientific Illustration Program, now at Cal State Monterey Bay. We talked about sort of adding these little sort of divots of darkness. So I put in little darkness divots with my dark brown pencil, adding a little bit of texture to this. It's just about done, but it doesn't look wet and slimy. Wet and slimy. White. So I'm going to mix up some thick white gouache. And here's the danger. It's fun. So you're gonna, you are not going to know when to start. And it'll be like, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great, this is great. And then you're going, I wish I stopped about a minute ago. All right? So just a little bit of white gouache, and bam, you've got those sharp, those sort of sharply bright white in there. This thing starts to feel wet. All right? So not wet, wet, not wet, wet. All right. A little bit goes a long way. Put it down, and then stop. So you see a little bit of white on here starts to feel like sort of moist skin. But you keep going with that and it just looks calico. And um, so you just want to be patient. This also brings us into looking at frogs. All right. um, frogs and toads are another kind of amphibian. They have to again go to the water in order to lay their eggs. Um, a few structural features that I want to point out, and we're going to kind of look more carefully in those. First of all, note that four in, toes in the front, five in the back, and you've got, again, these sort of inward turned arms. So it's not doing this, it's doing this. So very often you see fingers sticking out here, these ones rotating inward. Sometimes you can't see these back fingers because it's rotated so much in like this that the forearm is blocking it. All right, so you see just an arm coming down with a hint of a toe. 
The folded up back leg, very, very, very powerful and muscular back here. Some are adapted for uh, swimming when we have webbing between the toes. Avoid this symbol for the back foot. Right. Very often the toes will sort of sit together and you won't really see that webbing very, very clearly. But your brain wants to draw in that webbing symbol. So draw what you see, not what you think should be there. Um, another <coughs> cool frog feature is this eardrum on the side of the, behind the eye. There's this big thing here, the eardrum, bigger in males than in females. Um, and lastly, you'll see on a number of frogs, this sort of strange humpback look. Humpback look, especially in frogs that are big jumpers. You'll see this very strange humpback look. We'll take a look in just a moment at what is going on inside there to help you understand that and everything that is happening back here with this cool back leg. Not all frogs are big, um, are super jumpers. This one is very well adapted for climbing. This is another one that we California naturalists ought to get under our belt. This is the Pacific chorus frog. If you hear that sort of, uh, you're hiking uh, in, in, uh, after a storm and you hear that sort of ribbit, 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 sort of throbbing of multiple voices, that's the chorus frog singing to you. And um, it's a really fun frog. Um, the, uh, on the females, you get right in here, you, take, you open it up, and you, can, you just look here on the inside of the groin, right here in this very personal spot. And they have actually a transparent skin there. You can see the eggs inside their body. Make sure when you're doing this, your hands are damp so you don't damage their little amphibian skin. But you can see into their body, so it's a, a womb with a view. Um, uh, here's a little ear drum on this little character. Notice a little bit of restraint in putting that white in. It is fun, but you go too far, you're going to kill the picture. Um, keep, keeping the alignment of those eyes straight with the, the frogs don't do a lot of this movement of their torso all right? their, their head and their torso are going to essentially be a solid unit so the eyes are going to be aligned with the ridge that sort of strange bump on the back um, and uh, so there's a little bit of sort of frog geometry there um, On some frogs, you will also see this, um, this dorsal lateral ridge right here. Um, you see another one on the same side. There are paired ridges going down. Not on all species, but on some you will see that. Um, lastly, if this is the hip, what joint is this? What? Knee. knee. Yep, so here's the knee. Ankle. So here's the ankle. What's that? Right. So you're right. So uh, here, uh, phalanges or phalanges, the toes in the back here, and that's absolutely right. Um, let's take a closer. We're, we're used to thinking of the foot as this one solid unit because we think of how it's set up in human beings. These guys have a similar setup that, as we do, but a couple of interesting differences. Um, the front leg is really straightforward. I've got a shoulder, I've got an elbow, I've got a wrist. All right. But the back leg is this is this is interesting. Here's my hip bone. So this is the ankle. So this right here, these bones here are right here in these bones right here in my foot, my tarsal bones, all right? My tarsal bones, I've got five of them in there, one for each toe. In the frog, those tarsals are fused together into this double tarsal right here. Yes, like it, but, but for, but, but that would be in here. These are fused in here, they look ve but they look very much like the radius ulna. I, I don't. I think they're fused. To, they're fused together, so it's not getting that same uh, twist movement that we get uh, out, out of radius ulna. Um, and then I've got my toe bones sticking out from that. So it's just like me, except that this the, the instep part of the foot is fused together, and so that gives another point of bend 
that you can get this spring from. The more little joints are, z are zigzagging up in here, the more pop you're going to get in your hop. Um, so also, for more pop in the hop, my, uh, where my spine, my lumbar vertebrae come down into my sacral vertebrae here, in, to, into my hip bone, um, at that joint, I've got a little bit of motion. And for people who have low back pain, this is often a joint that really messes us up. The frog has an incredibly movable joint right there. So this joint between the lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum in here can, can bend and does bend dramatically. And so when the frog sits back, this folds up. When it jumps, this is another thing that is flipping the frog out to jump. So in a folded up frog, you'll see these hip bones popping up in the back. So I've got a joint here and all these other joints down there for boing in my frog. So bearing this in mind and this in mind, see if this makes sense. Is that cool? All right. So expect to see those points of the hip up there. Even if this leg is folded up, you'll still see a little hint of this little um, corner, this little joint, as that leg is kind of wrapped around and underneath that big folded up leg. Toads, very similar structure, but what do toads have that frogs don't? The warts. Right, these little bumps all over their skin. The warts are glands on the skin. And, oh yeah, the warts, um, there's a really big gland, especially right behind the eye, above the ear. Um, this, this big gland up here is a, um, is a poison gland. And so that helps it if the you know, dog or a fox bites it. You know, <clears throat> um, and every year there's like you know, fraternity boys who get into trouble because they, they've heard that like, if you lick the secretions of the glands of the cane toad, you can get high, dude. And so you know, Chip you know, is there licking the cane toad and ends up in the ER. Um, and so Chip, don't do that. Um, but yeah, respect the, the poison glands of the cane toad here. Um, and, uh, but yeah, little warts all over that body. They're not as adapted for those big jumps. To make these bumps look like they're sticking up, I've just got a little highlight on one side of them. Right? That highlight turns it from being a brown spot into a bump sticking up. Also, there's a little dark ring around each of these. And you'll notice that you can see more of the dark ring on the side that is closest to you and less on the other side. That's because the bump sticking up is obscuring some of that on the other side. And that helps you kind of get bumps that, are, that feel kind of sticky-uppy, unless they're pointing straight at you. This is our western toad. If you're living in this part of California, you'll see a bunch of these around. It's our most common toad. Uh, they sometimes squeak when you pick them up. Um, uh, they're really cool. Look at that cool eye. Horizontal pupil. Horizontal pupil. If you saw that in a human being, it would mean brain damage. <laughs> but it just means a happy western toad. Um, big uh, gland back here above the ear. We have another, uh, if you go out into some of the drier areas of uh, California, um, you'll run into this toad, the spade foot, that has a vertical pupil. So horizontal versus vertical pupils. Why does this skin look drier? What did I do artistically to make this skin look a little bit drier? What's going on there? Less contrast with the highlight. So a big, bold, opaque highlight feels wet and shiny. A duller, more transparent highlight feels like you just have light hitting part of a drier skin. So this feels doesn't feel all wet and slimy. The spade foots have these cool little um, hard pieces on their back feet that they use to help them with digging. Let's take a look at a step by step of creating one of these drawings. This is a drawing. Um, this is not an example so much of a field sketch, but more of a scientific illustration. It was done in the comfort of my studio 
looking at uh, uh, one of the photographs from California Herps. Right, so this is not an example of, you know, we wouldn't expect you to do this in the, 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 in the field, but we can use, we can steal a lot of ideas from the scientific illustration process and incorporate them into our nature sketching. So here, here's what I would do. So I would start just with the posture of this guy. And you know where I'm going with this, posture, proportion, angles. Right? Proportions of here, I'm combining the whole head and body as one unit. How wide is it? How long is that? And then I want to get my eyes, my shoulder girdle, and my hip bones parallel to each other down the back of my frog. Right? Because the, the frog is not going to be often turned up in the, the, the front part of its body. From here, I can suggest my legs. You notice that I'm not putting in, you know, here's that little um, tarsal corner on the leg and all that other sort of stuff. I'm just getting at how big are these legs and where are they relative on the body. So this is a more a little bit of proportions with this. Where does the leg come out? About how long is it? Another thing that I find very helpful, again, is looking at the negative spaces, the spaces between the spaces. Remember, soon you'll see this, this uh, lizard that I drew where the space between the front and the back leg, I didn't accurately observe that, and it ended up being too small. Right? So look at those spaces. Look at these shapes. This one in front here really carves a lot of the attitude of the frog. You get this angle in, and the whole shape starts to feel more froggy. But negative shapes, absolute gold. If you could do one thing to improve your drawing, you'd be to pay more attention to negative shapes and get your brain to sort of flicker back and forth between what you're seeing as a positive shape as a negative shape. Flicker back and forth. Sometimes I'm drawing the legs. Sometimes I'm drawing the space between the legs. Bap, 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 bap. As you're drawing, you're going back and forth. The more that you start to do that, you'll find a big jump in what you're able to draw. You don't color in these spaces, but you visualize those to draw this. Then, I've got a framework that I can hang my details on. Right. Again, I don't expect everybody to memorize all the details of a frog. Right. You know a few critical features to look for. Right. Then you're just actually referencing that frog that's in front of you. Here I can see a little bit of suggesting of webbing on that toe right there. Uh, no web toes in the front. When they're swimming, the front legs are pressed against the body like that. This is a leopard frog, and it has spots going up onto its body. Right. In drawing on those spots, just like a line that goes on the body, I can use spots to show the roundness of the surface that they're on, or the angle that something is, 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 is coming from. So um, if I'm drawing a, something that is wrapping around a round object, if I curve that stripe, around, I can suggest the roundness of that object. Or, let's say I've got a spot on a flat surface. I will see the roundness of that spot if I turn that surface to a different direction, or to a different orientation. That round spot will become a more slender ellipse. So if I'm looking straight down on a surface, I can see the full roundness. The more that that object is turned away from me, the more foreshortened those spots are going to become. So let's do that on the frog. Here's a spot that is pointing towards me. There's one that's more pointing back on a different surface. Here are spots wrapping around a round surface. This sort of line is gold for sculpting your frog. This curves around here. This, if, see, if this just was straight across there, it wouldn't look around. But having that really kind of wrap in there, you get the idea that this leg is going right into there. Look for those opportunities. Now I'm ready to start to add watercolor to it. With this, I don't need gouache. This one is going to have dark spots. If these were light spots on a dark surface, I might, add, I might put those in with gouache. But here I'm going to use this all with watercolor. So I'm going to start my same way, 
first thinking about the shadows, and that allows me to get a sense of the volume of my little frog. I let that dry, and now I'm going to go, same thing, from lighter into darker. So this has some light brown edges on some of its feet and patterns on the inside of its groin. And then a lot of the other parts are green, and I sort of modeled. So I first put in the light and then darker modeling over that. If I did the other way um, and put all this stuff, the, these other spots in, in, in first, um, and then tried to put, say, the green over these, I would smudge all these spots. But because I can put that green on first, I can then add all these darker things. So starting lighter, going darker. Um, going even darker. And then even darker with my black spots. The leopard frog has little pale lines around each of those black spots, so I just tr uh, drew those in with a gel pen. And I forgot that one. <laughs> that one. Oops. Oh well. This individual didn't have that, right? Um, it's just about done, but it doesn't look wet. So again, pull out the gouache, and you can get that. Oh yeah, I actually, before I did that, I put in a little bit of detailing with my, um, with a, a pencil. I just got a, some colored pencils and kind of squiggled it into some of these areas with sort of a, a random kind of tickling stroke and just added a little bit of more texture into there. So with or without that texture. And lastly, some highlights. No highlights, highlights. So where did you choose to have the highlights? The um, so I put um, highlights of the light is kind of coming in from this side. It's hitting part of the thigh here in the middle. It's hitting those raised bumps on the hip, a little bit in there little hint in there, a little bit on those dorsal ridges. And on those little eye bumps that are sticking up. I should also post the next step in this. I was having so much fun, I kept going, and I killed this drawing too. All right? Um, so just oh, restraint, restraint. Or if you are going to keep going, scan it before you do. All right. So this was, this was a studio drawing. So don't expect yourself to kind of like walk, oh, look, there's a frog, right? Um, this is a very, very cooperative frog. Um, again, mad props to CaliforniaHerps.com. This was an actual field sketch that I did of the head of a bullfrog kind of sticking up above the water and its reflection. Um, it was holding still. Um, and so if you can't see the whole frog, don't draw the whole frog, all right? Go with what you can get. Um, and you'll find that, you know, very often they'll sit there and pose, especially if you see them before they see you. So moving slowly, and you can get your herp on. Or you roll over a log. Sometimes the salamander will just sort of stand there for a little while and kind of go like... And now reptiles. All right. These, again, are studio illustrations. When I was drawing these, I was at the California Academy of Sciences with dead specimens on my lap. Um, photographs on the computer from CaliforniaHerps.com. And um, all the time in the world, all of my materials. And, um, and I could, at my leisure, draw these. They took about sort of two hours or so for each one. So those aren't, don't expect that from um, field sketches. But I'm going to extract from my process here a bunch of ideas which will help you be able to quickly draw um, reptiles in the field. All right. The first is, let's take a look at these things so that we can draw these to scale. Here's the big scale trick. It's the grid. If you just draw a grid on your paper and then turn those into scales. Right. If you're doing something from a distance, sometimes all you have to do is do this 
over part of the drawing, and you go like, oh, look, it's got scales. So scales, the rows are often make some really, really neat symmetry. And um, this is a way of very quickly capturing that. Um, rather than making the scale rows into perfect little checkerboard boxes, if there's a slight tilt to one of the sens sets of lines, you'll get things that are much better kind of scale shapes. This is how it would be on a flat surface. If this is wrapping around a cylinder, these are going to make a slightly, there's a slightly different uh, thing that's going on. So it's going to be parallel lines, but notice that at the very tip, it's going to tilt slightly and to make a slight S shape. So one way of thinking about this is here are my lines. All right. I am going to then slightly S them. Then I'm going to do another set the other way. And each one of those, what that does is as I go up this way, those sets of lines are going to pinch out into those four shortened scales up in there. So that little S thing foreshortens those scales for you. And you're going to see that when things go up around a really kind of rounded back. Um, not all snakes, though, have a really rounded back. Some snakes, you'll see, there's a real kind of triangular cross-section to those. And when you see that, um, sometimes you can just get away with dropping that grid right on the side of the thing. Or maybe just making it a little bit lighter and less, less distinct when you get up to the edge where you don't want to handle that. All right? Um, for shortened scales, they actually get more difficult to sort of pick out like, okay, that one's there, that one's there, that one's there. So you can just make it really clear what's going on here and then just kind of suggest it as you get to the edge. Ruh -roh. Um, well, this may be the start of our, um, our first our power charge. Oh. <laughs> and we're back. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Go for it. So um, maybe let's uh, sort of cut out that sort of uh, intermediate part. For, for friends at home, we have just had a power outage during the lecture. So I'm going to try to show you a, a few more things that you can do to um, help you be able to, um, to, to draw these, these, these herps. Um, one of the things that um, is interesting, if you look on the, on the underside of a snake, you don't have those same sort of uh, diamond pattern scales. There are bands of um, scales called scutes that go all the way across the belly. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to imagine that I um, took a section out of a snake and peeled the skin off. That would be mean. Um, and, and so you can see over the back of the snake, here's sort of its flattened out skin. So there's skin over the back, and in the same sort of model here, I'm going to put next to that um, the belly scales. This is um, a really powerful way of very quickly transcribing the patterns that you see on a snake. So. Um, what I'll often do, I'm, I'm out there and I see some really cool snake. Um, actually, the way I usually do it is like this. Actually, I'll slightly change this around. I, I do it vertically. Right. Um, so here's the back of my snake. 
um, going into it. So, imagine, so you can see how this is if you kind of peeled the skin off. Um, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll draw onto this whatever um, patterns I, I see. So if it's a garter snake and there's a, you know, a, a dorsal, a band right down the middle of the back and then a lighter one along the side. Um, I don't even, I don't have to go all the way out to have all of the back of the snake. I usually start just a little, very close to the crest and have a little section of skin from, um, imagine if this was the cross section of the snake, um, sort of starting somewhere in here, wrapping around like that, and you were to peel that out and put it flat. So I get the top dorsal band, the side dorsal band there, the, um, and then all this, the patterns that are on the scutes. Th this little diagram, you can really, really quickly sketch um, what you're seeing. Um, another thing that is uh, useful for, for a quick sketch is to pay attention to the patterns on the head and face of the, the snake. Up in the front of the face, there are going to be um, large scales that, let me see, um, there are going to be large scales on its face. So here is top view of a snake. Up here, there are going to be some big scales. Here's the center line of my head. Typically, there are two very large scales over the top of the head like that. And then in from that, there are scales that go over the eyes. These are the ocular scales here and here. And in some species, you'll have either one or two scales in this little space in between. And in the front, there's a section up here of more small scales. And the number and the pattern of these is going to be different on different species. So making a little diagram of these head scale patterns, you can get um, a lot of information about. You have some snake, you don't know what species it is. This is a great little thing to record. Um, the part back here, this is going to be all small scales. If I take this snake and I look at it from the side, whoopsie, I always had my cheat sheet going right up here. But I just lost it. Um, if I'm looking at a snake from the side, there are a number of other really kind of helpful things that I can 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 do here. Here is my snake's eye. And so I'm going to have that ocular scale, that big scale above the eye here. Just like birds have eye rings, snakes have an eye ring too. And you'll see a set of scales like a horseshoe going all around its eye. And I'll put um, up on my, uh, my website some uh, blog posts with this because we can't get it into this workshop. Um, uh, but there's also a, there's a set of big scales on a lot of species that go over the upper lip and a set of smaller scales on the bottom lip here. These are called labial scales. And their number and actual shape ends up being a really useful identification feature. 
Um, so the I'll have my, my big eye up here. What herpetologists will do is they'll actually they'll, they'll map out, they'll draw, they'll measure the relative proportions of these different uh, scales. Do you have ones that are narrow up here or are they square? What are the shapes of those scales? Ends up being a really useful um, thing for you to uh, identify. They also will count these scales, these labial scales, because um, you know, for instance, among um, there's two very similar looking garter snakes that we have around, but one has eight scales up there, the other one has seven scales up there. So a kind of quick, useful way of, uh, of blocking those things out. Um, there's a nostril up here. There's a nostril up here, and there are there's a set of little scales that go right around that nostril. And in between those are going to be variable numbers and shapes of, of, of other little scales. Ring around the eye, those labial scales, um, and then those two big ones back here, up behind the eye. Um, you get those and you've got some of the major head scales for your snake. Um, so what I recommend people do if you catch yourself a snake, try not to do that with a rattlesnake, but you catch yourself a non-venomous snake, you can hold it uh, gently in your fingers and be able to draw those patterns of scales on the head before you release it. You don't know what type of snake you have, that's going to be useful information along with those patterns on the body. Um, it is difficult to do a you know scale by scale full body rendering of these these snakes. Like let's say you see a, a a rattlesnake and it's got all these spots down its back. It's got these scales going everywhere. How on earth do you kind of break that down and 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 draw it? I'm not going to want to get this close. But also even if I did, um, on rattlesnakes. Rather than big plates up here, they just have two big plates above their eyes, and most of the rest of the face is just little scales. Some of them will have a few other big scales, like um, on uh, like if this was a uh, rattlesnake head, kind of more triangular, and here's my big ocular scales here. Um, some have just little scales in between. There's one rattlesnake that has two really big scales up in there. Um, in this part of California, if you find that, uh, number one, you're too close. Number two, you probably found the Mojave green rattlesnake, which is this really, really cool rattlesnake because rather than just having venom that destroys your tissues, it has venom that uh, also affects your heart rate and your ability to breathe. <laughs> and um, so it affects your nervous system, your heart and your, your, your lungs. And um, so that's uh, just like a cobra has that neuro um, toxic venom. It's a pretty cool little critter. Um, those are over on places on the eastern side of the Sierra. Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah, just sort of seeing the snake, can't, that's right, I show excited, that can affect your heart rate. A um, couple of other thoughts on a Let's say you do um, find a rattlesnake out there. Other kind of cool things to look for and ways of documenting that. One thing to notice is how much of a constriction there is at the base of the tail. Um, the, um, that can help you to tell the, the difference between males and, 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 and female snakes. The, um, um, the a, uh, another thing that you can do is as there's, there's patterns on the backs of these things um, the patterns are going to change as you go down the snake and um, if you have the time and you want to do, do them all you can but often it's going to be coiled up it's hard to see what you can do is just sort of take some representative sections and say that all right, this part here, my spots in here are this shape. And in the mid body, they are um, they are more open centered things. And down here at before the rattles, um, 
they are making little black and white zebra bands across the tail. You can sort of block that um, snake out into little sections and um, that and be able to record its pattern that way. That's a lot easier in the field than trying to do a drawing head to toe because um, they have no toes um, of, of, of that snake. Um, and let me see if there's any other. Oh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about lizards. With lizards, I think the stuff that I can most easily show you without the, the slides is um, they're like uh, snakes with legs. But they also have other features that uh, you don't see on snakes, particularly um, eyelids and an external ear opening. Um, so on a lizard head, here's my eye, I'm going to have big eyelids. Um, and so they can blink. Um, another thing that is a, a very, I'll put this other kind of ocular scale here, um, a very sort of lizardy feature is they have back here a little flap by a pit in the side of their head. And that pit is its ear opening. So they've got external ears back there. Uh, not, not external ears. Uh, uh, they've, they've got internal ears, but they've got an, a, an opening to the outside. On frogs, that's all covered up by a membrane. But there's an actual little hole there uh, that you can sort of see kind of going on the side of the, um, on the, side of the lizard. Another um, neat lizardy feature is the back foot. So on lizards, you're going to have five toes in front and five in the back. But their back foot, uh, on a lot of lizards, you'll see a really odd structure. And the first time you're trying to draw that from a lizard that's wiggling around out there in the field, it's going to be difficult. Um, but uh, if you know what you're going to be getting into, then it's going to be a little bit easier for you. So um, here is lizard footness. Um, on, the, on the front of the foot, there is a... There are, this, I'm going to have sort of a block of my foot coming down like this. I'm going to have four toes getting progressively longer. And here is toe with a little claw one. Here is claw two. Here is claw uh, toe three coming down. And here is toe four coming down. So four toes getting progressively longer. Then um, there's also a fifth toe of middle length, but there's a space in here between it and the rest of the toes. So you've got this very odd looking toe arrangement. and. Um, it's uh, sort of confusing to, to get that at the start. But take a look out there at the little um, lizards. If you forget this, you can always check its feet. But going and sort of drawing some lizard feet from photographs or other reference material and just sort of playing with that a little bit before you're out there in the field with these lizards will help you be able to remember what you're seeing much more vividly. Um, lastly, if I want to put a little bit of scale action on this, I don't have to wrap those scales all the way around it. I can just sort of suggest in the center portions of these sorts of things that these are scaly. And what that does is as you get towards the edge, sort of people sort of will read that as... Um, Oh, it's harder to sort of see the definition of scales as they're rounding around the edge. And it's easier for you to draw. And once you put on top of that, you know, whatever sort of dark stripes are wrapping around the leg of this lizard, those little scales in the background really 
how you got that effect is not going to be really apparent to people. So that's a really quick kind of shorthand way of getting the scaly look onto your little lizard bodies. Um, the best way to mess with this is to start playing with it. I really recommend that people go to californiaherps.com. Here's your homework. You owe me five anatomical studies. So what an anatomical study is, you're going to find some herp there and make a drawing of it where you're getting yourself to really look for like the nasolabial groove and the costal grooves or the cool lizard foot. Um, or, or check this out. Here's a neat thing with um, uh, western fence lizards that we have out here. Um, western fence lizards have a big scale right back here behind the eyes and it actually has their third eye, their third eye right in the middle of that scale. Um, and that's a little uh, scale that uh, tech detects um, how long that lizard's been out in the sun. Um, and it's like that little thing that pops out on the turkey when you take the turkey out of the oven. Um, they've got this thing that goes off in their brain from light that comes through those cells and says, okay, lizard, it's time to go back under a rock or you're going to cook your little lizard self. So really cool little parietal eye um, out there. So um, when they're doing their yoga, they're focusing on their third eye right there. They don't stay out in the sun for too long. It's just, they're just cool. Um, so you do th five studies where you're going to find some critter and try to get yourself to notice the key anatomical features, the eardrum on the side of the frog. Does it have those ridges going down the back? Can you see that little angle in the foot of the frog um, where those phalanges start, right? Um, those, so five little anatomical studies. You might try one for a, um, a lizard, one for a frog, some different species, just to kind of look at real pictures of things. If you, of course, if you have a pet reptile, do some sketches from that, right? Um, then what I'd like you to do is to do two studies of um, a, a more kind of careful studies of uh, amphibians where your goal is to not just look at these structures, but to start to play with the textures of the skin. So how can you suggest scaliness? How can you suggest wetness? How can you suggest wumpy, lumpy, bumpy wartness on the outside of the, of the, the, the body? You put all those things together, you're going to have um, a, your, your, your complete beastie. All right? um, don't get stressed out by looking at a photograph of a snake and saying to yourself, oh no, I have to draw every scale on this. Right. Um, see if there are ways that you can suggest scaliness, simplify the drawing task for yourself, or make a diagram, a diagram that um, you can use to sort of simplify that information. You, again, you don't have to have every little scale drawn on there, especially on some crazy coiled serpent. Um, you'll just drive yourself nuts trying to figure out, like, this scale row goes around here, but then how does it come out over here? And you'll get so wrapped up in scale, 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 scale that it's not going to sort of feel like that snake. Um, those, again, those, those detailed snake scale by scale drawings, that's done for, it took forever to do with kind of ideal conditions. Have fun with it. The more you do, the better and better it will get. Doing a few studies now will help cement this in your brain and will also help you be able to see those features on the real frog when it's out there in the field. Or if you're coming on our next field trip, which is going to the um, Curiodicy Museum in uh, San Mateo, um, we're going to go to the Curiodicy Museum. They've got a whole bunch of herps in a, uh, in behind glass there. They're alive, but they'll be kind of hanging out, letting you um, sketch them. And um, even if you're not interested in drawing those guys, there's, oh, they've also got bobcats, gray fox, badgers, otters, um, all sorts of really fun to sketch critters. Burrowing owl. <coughs> so um, if you're not delighted by the reptiles and amphibians, stay for the burrowing owl. Um, also want to remind people, it is our 
um, our potluck. Potluck, so bring something to share with other people. And um, the uh, and a little fork and a bowl, and we will eat well. The more that you sketch, the better and better this is going to get. So see if you can get some of the uh, get over the fear of scales or these sort of weird limbs on these critters just by playing with that in your journal, and it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you for coming, and I hope this workshop was useful to you. What? Oh, that's right. Um, so uh, just sort of a head, heads up about uh, the upcoming year. Um, so Nature Journal Club, um, oh, which also reminds me of the donation can. So this is a donation can, and this is how I support myself um, doing these workshops. Um, if you're able to make a donation, I greatly appreciate that. If not, keep coming and keep doing this. Um, the more you do, the better it will get. Um, nature journaling doesn't have to be an expensive thing that you do. Every dollar that you donate now is matched by the Dean Witter Foundation. They've given me a, they've given me a challenge to try to uh, make, uh, raise $20,000 by the end of the year. And um, we're more than halfway there, which is really, really exciting. I um, was listening to something on, on public radio recently about how a lot of nonprofits and arts organizations have had to kind of close down because uh, charitable giving is way, way down. And it made me realize how grateful I am to this community of, of, of people who are uh, supporting me doing this. And it really makes a big difference for me to be able to continue this. I want to let you know that I don't take it for granted, and I really appreciate um, what you have done for me and are doing. Um, it's for the Nature Journal Club. Um, it is going to be um, this and more. Um, so every month there will be a nature journaling workshop. I'm going to be gone for two months next month. That's um, June, July. During that time, there are probably going to be other members of the Nature Journal Club who are going to be stepping in and doing some demonstrations. Some people will be going around to different sites. Um, so there still will be workshops. Um, and you also get to sort of see the teaching style and approach of some of the other um, uh, people in our group. The, um, when I return, I will also do two additional um, workshops at, at some different times of the, the, the month. So some months will have two workshops in them. So I will still do 12 workshops next month. Um, and um, the, I also am planning to open up two new locations for these uh, workshops. Um, probably one will be on the other side of the Caldecott Tunnel to try to help people who are on the, the other side of the mountain. Um, and also um, up in the Bayview area of uh, Hunter's Point and um, bring some nature journaling to other parts of the San Francisco Bay Area that um, we haven't been able to, to reach at this point. So really looking forward to doing that. Um, so yep, next year um, the Nature Journal Club is going to continue and we're going to keep doing great stuff. I um, want to encourage everybody who is watching this who is uh, not in the San Francisco Bay Area to start a nature journal club of your own and sort of find out what happens when you start to build a community of people who start to share ideas of how we can use and, and do our journals and get some, some support group uh, behind this process. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and thank you for joining us.